Um, so I am very, very happy to introduce Dr. Yulia sander Maskaya as our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, Yulia leads the application research team of the Neuromorphic Computing Lab at Intel. Her team developed spiking neuronal network-based algorithms for neuromorphic hardware to demonstrate the potential of neuromorphic computing in real-world applications. Before joining Intel, uh, Yulia led a group Neuromorphic Cognitive Robots in the Institute of Neuroinformatics at the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. She chaired EUCOG, the European Society for Artificial Cognitive Systems, and coordinated an EU project, Neurotech, creating and supporting the neuromorphic computing technology uh, community in Europe. I am very, very excited to hear Yulia's presentation. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to her to talk about some of her recent results. Thank you so much, Kari. Thanks for a very kind introduction. Um, let's see, can you see the slides uh, in full screen? Yes. And not seeing anything that doesn't belong there. I hope. Yes. All right. Yeah, so welcome to this talk. I will talk about neuromorphic computing, maybe a little bit uh, about where I or we at Intel see the future of neuromorphic computing. Try to create you know, some inspiring landscape here in our field. Um, I have to show this little disclaimer. Whatever I, I tell you here is uh, my personal view, uh, uh, not obligatory sign signed by Intel. So let me start with just flashing this picture of um, our Intel's neuromorphic research chip OE here. I, I'm pretty sure most of you have already heard or read about it, so I don't need to go into detail, but just as a reminder, so when we talk about neuromorphic hardware, what do we have in mind? And most of the features are shared by, by LOEHI, by Intel's neuromorphic chip with other um, systems. So we integrate computing and memory, right? We create this distributed system of neurons and synapses and the synapses, they do the computation and, and they also the memory that needs to be you know, local and spread all across the chip. Uh, we usually implement temporal neuronal models such as leak, integrate, and fire. So time is an important component of, of computation in, in neuromorphic hardware. We, of course, use spike-based communication. That is almost the definition of what neuromorphic chip is uh, and, and how it is different from other neural network accelerators. Um, these chips work best if, they, uh, if your network has sparse connectivity. And by best, I mean most energy efficient, efficiently. Uh, usually, neuromorphic hardware will support some type of on-chip learning, which allows you to do also you know, online continual learning. Um, and, and the fact that our chip is digital is maybe one aspect that, that distinguishes it from many other neuromorphic devices developed so far. So, so Intel supports digital asynchronous implementation. Um, we don't support floating point numbers. We don't do multiply accumulators, no off-chip DRAM. So it's really not a, a neuronal network accelerator. It is this um, you know, specific neuronally inspired computing substrate. So the good news for neuromorphic community, I think, is this plot that shows that there are some workloads and there are some tasks out there in which neuromorphic computing hardware seems to bring orders of magnitude advantages in terms of energy and time of solution compared to other computing technology. And, and we can see uh, on this plot that shows you know, the energy ratio, so how much certain workload was running um, on LOEHI more energy efficiently than on some other hardware, you know, either CPU or GPU, um, some neural network accelerator, more videos or Trunos chip, uh, and, and solution time ratio, so how much faster the solution was found on LOEHI versus other hardware. And you can see on this axis, different workloads, they, they have some, some spread, right? Some, some workloads might land somewhere uh, around the parity line, so you might get advantage by bringing some neural network on neuromorphic device, on LOEHI in particular here, um, or might even not. Um, but there are some workloads where you get this um, immense advantages, right? There are five orders of, of magnitude in terms of energy and three orders of magnitude in terms of solution time. And those workloads are, um, typically um, some, some new architectures. So those are not the typical deep learning networks that you would know from, um, you know, from, from conventional machine learning known today. So what we have here is, for instance, the LASSO, so the sparse coding network um, that implements some you know, winner-take-all um, competition between different you know, features to create sparse representation of your input. There's another you know, large point here, which is a constraint satisfaction problem solver. Um, so if you manage to um, uh, express your optimization task as a graph of states with constraints expressed as connections, as weights, then these type of tasks seem to be um, solved by neuromorphic hardware really efficiently. So really bringing um, you no know, large advantages compared to the state-of-the-art technology. Another point is graph search. 
So, so you can imagine if you create a graph on, on your neuromorphic hardware, then you can very quickly search different states um, in this graph very efficiently. So this is very promising um, already and very promising picture for, for neuromorphic computing technology um, that there are tasks and application domains and, and workloads where we get huge advantages. Let us remind ourselves of what is behind these advantages. So what, what are the key properties of neuromorphic hardware that allows us to get there, to get to this amazing performance? Um, and the first property is using spike in neuron matters. Um, and spike in neuron means that uh, our neurons have persistent states. So those are not just numbers, no, that are driven by input only. They have a state that persists over time. We usually have some type of temporal filters on top of this state. In a typical model, that would be leak, integrate, and fire, right? So the state decays over time. Um, but it could be some other temporal filter as well. And, and spikes are, of course, important. So this communication with discrete events allows us to make the systems really energy efficient and, and fast in many cases. The second distinguishing property is network topology. So in neuromorphic hardware, we're not bound to you know, this typical deep or convolutional neural networks. We could create some intricate network topologies, like, for instance, the ones that we need for graph-based search or constraint satisfaction problem solver, or create winner-take-all networks here and there. So we have um, a whole ocean of algorithms that um, one could develop and that would run efficiently in this hardware. And, and the third critical property is learning. Um, those lo local learning rules that typically neuromorphic hardware supports um, allow us to implement systems that can lo learn on the fly. Now, with all these at our hands and with those you know, individual workloads here and there showing promise, um, the question that we now could ask ourselves is how can we get beyond just having you know, these computing elements and these little um, examples and proof of concept tasks here and there? Because we know spiking neural networks must be a very, very powerful tool to control all kinds of behaviors, you know, perceptual behaviors, motor or motion control behaviors, planning, um, all kinds of cognitive um, or motor control tasks. Uh, you know, starting with uh, little insects and ending with sophisticated animals uh, as us humans, all these behaviors are in the end somehow generated by spiking neural networks. So the big question that we can start asking ourselves, how can we implement these type of behaviors? Maybe not immediately, you know, playing football, but maybe something like a landing maneuver for uh, like the bees do, or some, you know, visual control that is very precise and very fast, um, or maybe solving some, some planning tasks uh, and, and planning some sequences of actions in the future. How can we get there? The first step there, um, the first step to develop um, neuronal systems uh, that can solve tasks is deep learning today, right? Everyone is doing deep learning. People call deep learning systems artificial intelligence, full stop. Um, and, and that's uh, definitely you know, the, the step, the first step where we could and, and should start. So training fit forward neural networks. Um, and, and this is what has been done a lot on, on Loihi. And this is the first thing that, that people try to do because there are architectures out there, they can solve the task, they show impressive performance. Um, let's use those structures in order to you know, program neuromorphic devices to do something useful. Um, and despite of quite promising results, so we can see that these structure is a little bit limited, right? You, you, are, you are bound to this feed forward structure where you, know, you show some input, probably some image or maybe some sound file, and then you expect some, some output, some label or maybe position. Um, but there's so much more uh, needed in behaviors like this, right? This is not just about input and output. Um, there might be some complex sequences of uh, steps that need to be, um, you know, planned and developed. You might, you might need to create some quite complex representation of the environment around you. Um, that is difficult to imagine how it could uh, fit in just simply this feed forward structure, you know, from, from input and over complex, complex nonlinear transformation to some single output. Um, the fact that we can do some learning on chip um, extends, of course, this paradigm of pre-trained feed-forward deep neural networks. We can have, for instance, an output of a neural network, like in this example, right? So I just took the most advanced, uh, I think, example of a deep uh, learning that has been implemented on chip from, from Embry and group, where they not only ha had a pre-trained uh, deep neural network, they also had the readout had uh, being learned on chip on the fly so that you could add new gestures to, to this data set of gestures that the network can recognize. Quite amazing work, but, but still the, 
um, the overall behavior of this network is quite limited. And, and there is more that needs to, to come to it in order to have full behaving system. So how can we get there? How can we, from these uh, individual blocks that solve you know, one particular part of the task, maybe recognizing gestures, um, uh, maybe, um, you know, recognizing objects in front of the in front of the system how can we get to the full behavior and one way how we could do that is look back at the brain so have we already learned everything from the brain of course not so what can we learn from the brain um, about how to structure our networks for different tasks and, and the first thing that we should remind ourselves and realize that brains feature intricate structure on different levels if you look at an individual neuron it's like a little complex computing machine. Now, neurons have a lot of branches. They have multiple compartments. Um, the uh, dendritic branches often do some computation, even some nonlinear computation. Already an individual neuron is a pretty complex computing machine uh, with nonlinearities with multiple compartments. Now, multiple neurons in a local um, vicinity, they form circuits. Um, and, and many of you might be aware that our cortical structures, they have six layers. Um, and there are very particular types of neurons um, spread across these different layers. And they have very particular interconnectivity uh, between the, the neurons in different layers. Many of you might be familiar with so-called canonical um, circuit um, that is, has been found in these layers. And, and why do people call it canonical? Because it is conserved. You find the same connectivity structure across different brain regions. You find them even across different um, animal uh, species. Um, now, of course, in, in different animals, you might find different, you know, more or less canonical circuits like that. But the neurons definitely form some local circuits um, between layers, for instance, or in some local vicinity and local regions, which are not obligatory and learned. They are uh, probably pre-wired in the developmental process. Um, and then there are different types of neurons, you know, pyramidal cells, basket cells, I don't know how many dozens of different neuron types uh, there are. They all have different properties, you know, different activation thresholds, different types of spiking behavior. Um, it is definitely not a homogeneous substrate. It's not just you know, a matrix of numbers with which the brain computes. Now, on a slightly more microscopical level, different regions of the brain, they have different function, they have different behavior, they you know, work differently on this microscopical population level. Um, and they are often defined by their inputs and outputs. And there, you know, you probably know this homunculus, the somatosensory cortex, right, is defined by, by input that comes from, from your skin and from your joints, from proprioceptive sensors. Auditory cortex is defined by input that comes from auditory sensor. Now, you know, your uh, spinal cord also feeds back to, to the brain and eventually to the cortex. Um, and across these different regions, there are, again, different structures on the microscopical population level. People have found attractor dynamic-like uh, circuits, the circuits that generate attractor dynamics in many parts of the brain, on the sensory side and on the motor side, and also in between, like prefrontal regions. Uh, people have found multi-scale representations. I don't know if you're familiar with grid cells. They have this very different, very interesting structure um, where you can find cells that seem to Kind of tessellate space on different scales, on the fine scale, and then on the coarser scale, and on an even coarser scale. And people find this type of representations in different parts of the, of the brain. Um, you have multimodal representations that are responsible not, not only for single modality, let's say vision or audition, but they combine them in some way. You have a lot of hierarchical representations, so some kind of, kind of compositionality that you can see in the structures. And in many places, you see bottom-up and top-down convergence. So it seems like there is some kind of you know, anticipation or prediction going on that is then matched um, with the um, bottom-up input that is coming. Or there's some type of top-down modulation of your perceptual input. So when you can recognize the room in which you are in, then that will bias what kind of objects you expect to see there. Um, and there are these kind of top-down and bottom-up loops all over the place. So already um, in this uh, canonical microcircuit in the connectivity between the layers, you can see that there is some interplay like that happening on the microscopical level and then on a more microscopical level as well across uh, brain regions. And, and the third property is that we see plasticity and homeostasis are uh, all over the brain, right, with different rates, with different degree of plasticity um, present. 
um, there are different uh, learning rules that seem to be present in different brain regions. So some uh, neurons do STTP, some do uh, reverse STTP, some do heavy on learning. Depends on the conditions, dep depends on the neuron transmitters that are present. It's quite a, quite a complicated structure. So the question, one, one question that, that arises, so can neuromorphic hardware today support the complexity of the brain-inspired architectures? And the good news is that in many cases, the answer is yes. That certainly is the case for Folo Ihim, which is a digital chip, so we can simulate the neuronal models. Um, and Loihi supports multi-compartmental neuronal models, supports um, parameterizable neurons. So there are many parameters that you can tune to create neurons of different type. Um, you have large range of possible connectivity patterns. So again, you can emulate or simulate all those microcircuits um, or neurons that have different connectivity properties. You know, some connect to a lot of distant neurons, some have only local connections, some have inhibitory connections, some have excitatory connections. And we also have some, some freedom and flexibility in designing learning rules um, you know, with, uh, uh, with um, Kind of different parameters with tax and with modulation factors. So we can implement three factor learning rules, kind of modeling uh, that influence of some neurotransmitters on, on your learning behavior and behavior of the synapse. So it seems that on a microscopical level, we, we have some uh, bag of tools that allows us to somehow mimic the complexity of the neural networks that we see in the brain. What about the system level? So here I will show you a couple examples of uh, architectures that we have developed recently in, in my group. Um, I will start with example of object recognition. Object recognition is a canonical um, deep learning uh, artificial intelligence task. Um, however, when people try to do object recognition, not just on images, but in a robotic setting, in a behavioral setting, then it has been shown that the task is different from what we know from, from um, image-driven object recognition. And it has been shown by researchers in IIT, for instance, Lorenzo Natale, if you take um, a large network, it was trained on a huge data set of images to recognize objects. It can distinguish 100 classes. Um, if you now implement this model to recognize a couple objects objects on a robot, you know, on a tabletop in front of this robot, but the recognition rate falls from you know, above 90% to 30 or 40%. And, and you can see why. You know, the cameras of this robot might be really bad. You now they have huge aberrations. So everything looks like in a fisheye camera. Um, they might have bad white balance. They might be slightly blurry. The robot sees this object from some funny angle which was not really typical in the data set that was used to train that large network. Um, then the objects might be also some particular object, like, you know, my favorite cup has some, some really weird you know, writing on it. Um, and, and, and besides, I you know, uh, in this task, I, I don't forget to want to recognize any possible, you know, cat or car uh, in the world. I want the robot to be able to recognize you know, the 10 objects that they wanted to deal with. So the task is uh, somehow quite different. So that's why we, we took the challenge to, to develop uh, a neural network architecture that will run on neuromorphic chip, will be energy efficient, will work with event-based camera, um, and will allow the robot to learn a couple object representations on the fly. Um, and the architecture, I will just lead you through, through this. So we, we've run it on a real robot as well, but we of course work a lot with the simulation. So this is a simulated ICAP robot. It has a simulated event-based camera in its eyes. It can move this camera in order to you know, generate events because the scene is static. We have a tabletop, we have a couple objects that we can put in front of this robot. Um, we make the robot do little micro saccades. We collect the events um, and we send them to a network that does um, feature extraction and, and then learning of patterns. The feature extraction that we have done is very, very simple. It's basically an HMAX architecture, a couple Gabor filters, and then a couple layers of those. Just try to, to find some you know, compact, efficient representation that allows us to distinguish a couple objects that we want to, to learn. Um, we take um, a small region and a region of interest from the visual field of the robot. And we make sure that this region of interest is centered on the object of interest. So we have some, some kind of a fovea that allows us to make the network small. So it will be it will run now quickly and efficiently on, on our hardware. Now learning happens in a single plastic layer in this whole network. So all the feature extraction is just pre-trained or fixed. Um, and, and learning only happens in these in this synapses that are dashed here from the final feature extraction layer to our output neurons. Output neurons form groups, each group for a given object. And within a group, each neuron represents a different view of the object. So some objects look really differently from different um, viewing angle. 
um, and the system decides if um, I'm going to learn an object now, I, I don't recognize it, but I have heard a label um, that I have heard before. So it must be the same object, but it looks so different so differently now that I don't recognize it, it will uh, recruit additional neuron to represent this view of an object. So the important part of this network is this neuronal state machine. Um, so these are, this is a neuronal circuit with individual neurons that detect different states of the network. For instance, one of the states could be the input is present. So I see some spikes here on the input, uh, on the output layer of the recognition network, but I don't recognize any object. So there's no output active. This is a state that means I don't recognize the object that's in front of me. I should ask the user what this object is about. So I ask the user, hey, what is it? I don't know what this object is. I then listen to a label, and then I have another neuron that detects the state, whether this label has been heard before or whether I hear this label for the first time. And then depending depending on whether it's a new object, I recruit a new group of neurons to learn a new object, or I just recruit a new neuron within already established group because it's some new view of an object. Um, if I make an error, if I recognize an object and it's the wrong object, that's a huge event, um, um, in, in which case I update the representation both of the you know, false positive and then false negative, trying to uh, bring these two object representations apart. So as you see, we, we had to create quite an intricate structure uh, in order to solve this task in this uh, embodied, I would say, setting, interactive setting, when the robot tries to learn a couple objects in an interactive setting with a human. Now, this is only part of the story because, uh, yeah, let's, yeah, so, so first, no, to say that it works. So what we have shown, uh, we can make the system autonomously allocate different number of view neurons depending on the complexity of the object. So for instance, for tennis ball, there will be only one view neuron allocated because tennis ball always looks like a tennis ball. And some, you know, the wrench or hammer will have a couple of view neurons allocated because it looks so differently under different viewing angles. Um, we show that we can learn continuously, like over many, many trials, we can build the representation and over time, you know, the error neurons will never be active because we have learned a couple of objects that we could learn. Um, and we would show some, some decent performance compared to other continual learning tasks. Now, this whole object learning and recognition network is, of course, only part of the story. Because if I now want to put this recognition object on a robot and I wanted to interact with a human and, and learn in this overall interactive setting, I need a couple more components. One component is attention dynamics. Um, um, because, uh, so remember, we have cut out the region of interest from the central part of the field of view of the robot. Now we need to bring this uh, region of interest onto different objects. So we need some, some fast course system that will detect potentially interesting objects. So we need some um, object uh, driven attention dynamics. And, and there are some models out there that allows us to do that. Um, so this attentional module will make the robot move. Uh, we say look, like look at different um, objects. And when we know the object is centered in the field of view, then we can make a micro saccade and, and feed the events into our recognition system, try to recognize an object. If object is not recognized, then that's uh, activates the learning behavior of the robot. And for the learning behavior, the robot will ask the user for the label, will look at the object again, and now you know, ru run the learning dynamics. And it will try to recognize the object again. Now, if it can recognize it, it knows I have learned this object, I can look at to some other object. So there's a whole behavioral organization system or another neuronal state machine in play that orchestrate all those different behaviors of the robot. And, and also orchestrate an you know, attentional network and recognition network. Um, another part of the system is what I call SLAM here, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping System. Um, this is simply a system that builds spatial representation of the scene in front of the robot so that the robot remembers where the objects were that it has recognized. So it learns associations between you know, different visually recognized objects um, and places on the table. And a little twist here that places on the table are represented in motor coordinates of the robot head, because these are convenient coordinates to use if you want to look back into, into an object. So as you see, that's quite an intricate architecture, almost like a cognitive architecture that is behind this behavior. First example. The second example, the SLAM network itself. So if we think about simultaneous localization and mapping, this is a famous task in robotics um, in which um, you know, an autonomous mobile agent is exploring an unknown environment, needs to localize itself in this environment. So it needs to keep track of its position 
typically it needs to do something called path integration. So it needs to integrate motor commands that have been issued in order to make an estimate, where am I now in the environment? And then once in a while, it's lucky enough to see something interesting in the environment, and then it can form association and remember where this thing was and form some kind of a map. So um, if you think of SLAM in terms of a uh, no, deep learning task, um, it, it is possible to, to formulate it like that and design like that, but um, the solution will be you know, a large and bulky um, network that won't work very well in the end. So following biological footprint, but also similar to uh, kind of more conventional software architectures for, for SLAM, um, we have developed a uh, neuromorphic version of SLAM that has different components again. So one component is a head direction module. This is the module that only tracks the orientation of your agent, the orientation of a head for a rat, uh, for us it's orientation of the whole uh, robot. And it does path integration. So it takes the angular velocity uh, that is either measured by an IMU or is the command that they send to move the robot and integrates it. So it's a little circuit that does path integration and moves this bump that represents the position um, no, on the, in the angular space of the uh, robot's no, heading, moves it around to, to represent the current orientation. So we have done some work that, that shows that this module can work. Uh, Konstantinos Michmizos and his colleagues have also done some work and they have done some thorough benchmarking of this work and have shown that they can be 100 times more energy efficient compared to you know, some other techniques running on the CPU. So showing that this whole neuromorphic slam direction is quite promising. Now you have just seen the two-dimensional extension of this head direction idea to keep track of the heading, like heading pose of the um, head of the robot. And in this work, we have shown that you can do it quite precisely with even limited number of, of neurons. So you can track the orientation of the head quite precisely. Now the second step um, in the SLAM network is now to build the 2D map of the environment. This is what in biology we know place cells um, are doing with help of grid cells. Place cells, those are the cells in the hippocampus that seem to be to, to become responsible for different positions in the environment. And grid cells, they seem to be responsible for kind of vectors that move you between different positions. Um, so the, the structure that we need in order to replicate this behavior of place cells and grid cells is again quite intricate structure. So first we have the heading direction network that we have seen before, right? So this is the heading direction, these are the shift uh, clockwise or counterclockwise populations that shift the bump in either direction depending on the perceived angular velocity. Now, depending on the direction in which I am moving, I will move, move my two-dimensional bump, right? Uh, that represents my, my position. Um, and in order to do this you know, with some reasonable number of neurons, we again have to come up with some architecture that will move the bump in some oblique directions based on kind of cardinal um, direction, cardinal shift directions um, represented only. Because it's difficult to imagine how the shift could happen uh, for any possible direction, you know, 360 degrees around you. Um, so again, so many components of the architecture, you need to you know, take the speed of your movement, take the direction of your movement, and then you integrate them to make an estimate where you are now in the place. Also has been done by, by Rafaela Kreisen in her PhD thesis, and she has shown this can work, this can work fairly precisely, um, even with just a handful of, of neurons. Now, the final step in, in SLAM is map formation. So map formation usually in neuromorphic SLAM amounts to learning associations between some visually perceived uh, places, so some recognized places um, and, and estimated positions, right? So if you have some, some sheet of neurons, it represents the positions and then you have some uh, you know, bag of label neurons that label different interesting places, then you can learn associations between, between these two vectors, sorry a bit too far. And again, we have shown that, that you can do that. You can learn these associations, you can forget them. So if you come to the same place, you, you don't see you know, the salient uh, feature here, it would be a wall in the environment, then you slowly forget it. So you need both potentiation dynamics and, and um, depression dynamics in those plastic synapses. So remember, these all are some neuronal populations living on the neuromorphic chip. Spiking, spiking dynamics, um, synapses, all our usual stories. Now, another and the last important component of SLAM is uh, detecting errors in your representation. So in SLAM, people uh, talk about loop closure event. This is the happy moment when you revisit the location where you have been before, you recognize this location, and now you can have two um, place estimation for this location. One currently estimated based on your odometry um, and the other one from the memory. So you remember where this place was last time when you have been there. 
And in this moment, you have a chance to estimate the error between the two, the discrepancy between the two, um, and then act upon it. So, so this is again some neuronal architecture that allows you to do that for one dimensional case only, right? So you have the heading direction representation. One is the currently estimated based on your path integration. Another one is from memory, right? Based on, in this case, some blinking LEDs that represent interesting places. You have learned the associations between the two. So now when you re revisit some LED, you can evoke this memory association. This is where the LED has been last time, um, but currently I estimate it to be you know, somewhere else. And then we have these two-dimensional um, sheet of neurons that computes uh, errors, uh, computes difference between the two um, you know, positions encoded in, in these two populations, for one from memory and one from current path integration. And we just do a very coarse estimation of this error and we divide it into two classes, small error or large error. If the error is small, we say, hmm, probably my path integration was not precise enough. Probably I have to recalibrate my uh, velocity integration system. And there's a mechanism how to do that on chip by, by learning on chip um, so that I now integrate velocity you know, faster or slower so that my movement of my peaks in, in this architecture is aligned with movement in the real world. And if the error is large, then, then probably something has changed in the environment. So I will just change my map. I will just forget that, that um, you know, LED position that is probably wrong now and learn the new one. Okay, so, so quite intricate architectures that you need to design here in order to enable this behavior. And then the last example that, that you know, speaks to the same story basically is the um, ultra fast vision based controller that we have built. So we had, have had this, um, I don't know if I will show it, but I'll just explain it. So we had this benchmark from, from David Scaramuza's lab. Um, David works with racing drones, so really fast flying drones. And, and he's a big fan of uh, event-based vision of neuromorphic cameras because they allow him to do vision-driven maneuvers uh, with um, a very high speed. That is, would be completely unthinkable with conventional camera uh, with 30 frames per second. So what David has shown um, that um, with event-based camera, he can track uh, movement of a disk. The disk is very simple visual pattern. It's just a line, a horizon. Um, but the, the drone can track this disk um, at up to 2000 degrees per second rotations. So really, really fast movements. Um, and, and we wanted to um, kind of bring this functionality on chip to, to show that you can do it in neuromorphic hardware as well, maybe at lower power than, than before on the CPU. Uh, and we have shown that you can actually do it even faster if you do both visual processing and control on, on the chip. Um, so how have we done it? We again have developed uh, a neuronal architecture, a neuronal system, a structured neuronal network um, by solving this uh, PID control task first, so proportional integral derivative control task, just following you know, the equations of the PID controller. First, you compute the error between the reference angle, let's say, and, and the measured angle. So this module will compute this error. We have a representation of the measured uh, angle as a population code. And then we have the representation of the desired angle. And then again, we have this little error computing circuit that computes differences to compute the error between the two. And then we have three pathways, right? We have one for proportional that just copies the error. Then we have one for integral that integrates the error with the previous values of the error and gets the integral term. And the other one is derivative. There again, we compute the differences and then that's a proxy for derivative. So we can build one control like that. We can build nested control like that to control both the angle and, and the position, uh, so the angular velocity and the angular position uh, in a nested fashion. Um, and then we need to uh, make sure that we can somehow read out from, from this network. And, and there we often need to translate between different neuronal representations. So in, in this part of the network, we use so-called place code. And this is where the identity, the index, the address of the neuron represents the value. So in this population that represents the measured angles, you now the fact that this neuron is spiking means that the measured angle is you know, 33 degrees. Um, now, for um, when we uh, sum up the three contributions of the proportional integral and derivative pathways, um, it happens to that it's better and easier on chip to do it in rate code. So we create populations um, in which the value is now represented by population rate. So how many neurons in the population have spiked in a particular time step that represents your value? Is it only one neuron? Is it five neurons? And then it's easy to sum up 
um, two signals in, in this representation, two or three signals in this case, in this representation. And then in our case for readout, we have translated it into place code again, um, because in our case, um, readout of uh, the index of the address of the spike in urine, so like as an address event representation was easier than counting how many spikes came from a certain population. Um, we have put it on chip. Um, I, I, I don't show here, but we also put the visual processing part on, on chip as well. So that's the one that detects lines uh, in the visual input. Um, with a very simple mapping um, where we have two layer network that implements the half transform. You can imagine how that um, can be done by just encoding the connection weights between the two population, encoding the, the half transform function into these connectivity metrics. Then you can do half transform for each event that comes from the camera in one time step. And we can continue. So this is now more future works in plan, right? So now if we combine something like SLAM with something like control, then we can create the system that can understand the environment uh, around the robot. So understand uh, what objects are positioned where, um, and then use that information to control robotic effectors very quickly because we can do it all very fast, all in the same system with low power. Um, and the examples where that could be used not to control some arm for manipulation, maybe it's robotic arm you know, attached on, on a wheelchair of someone and, and it needs good understanding of the environment around in order to be able to direct movement to different objects. Um, or it can be some mobile robot that can now navigate in the environment and position itself to solve different tasks. Another aspect of uh, you know, this planning and control is that in, in many tasks, especially if you have a complex robot, so with the uh, complex effectors that um, does some complex dynamics, for instance, stepping dynamics, so controlling this select robot is really a complex task. Um, and even if you have um, understanding of your environment, where you know, the obstacles are, where the good footsteps are, you still might need to do some, some planning and some choosing which path to choose. There might be many different um, you know, trajectories that I could choose. Um, some are better than the others, some not. So I need to do some optimization in order to find the best trajectory or even feasible trajectory in some, some horizon. So people do it in something called model predictive control. When you try to kind of predict how my behavior will unfold in time, and then just follow this prediction while predicting further all, all the time. In order to solve this task, you need to solve some constraint optimization problem in this control loop, which means you have to do it really, really quickly. And if your robot is a fairly complex you know, beast, like this animal robot with uh, you know its center of mass that you need to control, all the legs you need to control, you don't want to fall, you don't want to bump into things. There are many constraints and many variables involved. You can see how this is a massively parallel um, optimization problem that you want to solve very quickly at low power because you're in an embedded robotic system. Um, so we have found that this type of task actually is supported quite well by, by neuromorphic hardware, so in particular by, by Loihi. We have shown it on some other tasks. The, the classical task would be something like Sudoku solving. So Sudoku is a constraint optimization problem. Uh, but we have also shown it on some train scheduling tasks where, um, you know, the Power consumption on the commercial solver just goes up, uh, while on Loihi it um, stays constant. And it's not only power, it's also um, the speed, so how quickly we can, can converge. So we have shown speed up up to 14 times and then a couple orders of magnitude and energy gain. So we are very ho hopeful that this task can probably be solved with neuromorphic hardware as well. So what is the conclusion of these examples is that uh, programming and creating neural networks that will solve different tasks um, and creating these networks efficiently so that we can uh, play around with them. We can design like, different um, neural architectures and then try them out and refine them. Uh, it's a major challenge today. And all the examples that I have listed, they, they required wiring up some architectures for different functions and behaviors. It required creating some attractor networks, you know, the famous winner-take-all, or as we call them, dynamic neural field architectures. They um, required creation of some relational networks. Those would be these error estimation circuits that compute differences. Um, they can be used for reference frame transformations. They can also be used to encode different operations, like you know, plus or minus, or some other operation that includes three variables variables, you know, A plus B equals C. Um, we needed some space to rate code transformations you know, for efficiency uh, purposes or because some operations might be easier in one representation versus the other. Um, we need populations with different receptive fields, uh, with different you know, in-star or out-star connectivity. We want to blur something or want to prune or downsample something between the layers. 
we might need to create some associative learning layers, like in that SLAM network where we were learning associations between places and positions. Like just one example, you can imagine many, many more examples like that. Um, we need to create those neuronal state machines to ensure that our uh, you know, heterogeneous modular architecture can work autonomously and different parts of the architecture you know, are engaged or disengaged in time or learning um, behaviors are triggered or, or not, depending on, on the states in which the system uh, finds itself. And then we need to sometimes need different mappings you know, between maybe different modalities, maybe different reference frames, maybe according to some learned associations so we need all these uh, structures, and today we need better tools to specify such systems, you know, to, to design these, these different structures, going beyond just the well-known structure of layered convolutional networks. We think that we need much, much more. So uh, this is one of the first times when, when I will mention one of the tools or the tool on which we are currently working, so a new neuromorphic programming framework that we call LAVA, uh, following our volcanic um, naming conventions for for intel's neuromorphic chips so we plan lava to be open open source to encourage broad adoption and, and uh, convergence it will be open source on github with uh, two different types of licensing so we, we use a bit more restrictive licensing for lower level uh, functions and more permissive licensing for all the algorithms and architectures that will be built on top of very low level functions we think this lava framework um, should be chip agnostic so of course we begin it as an sdk for our loihi chip but we hope that it will be possible uh, to port it to other platforms as well and that it will just help to um, kind of bring the whole field of neuromorphic computing on a new level um, it is paradigm agnostic um, so you know you might have guessed that i'm not very big fan of deep learning but but uh, we have to admit that deep learning did solve many difficult tasks uh, nicely so our goal is to connect all tools that are out there you know slayer which is the way to train deep spiking neural networks dynamic neural fields and attractor networks um, nengo with its paradigm how you can create dynamical systems with spiking networks spy torch um, just bring it all under under one one hot under one um, in one library um, we are focusing on intel's core strengths so there will be low level network mapping so that networks can run efficiently um, on, on our hardware uh, we'll have cpu and gpu simulation not everyone um, has access to, to a chip but might might want to you know try out some architectures and, and we hope to be able to support it very well so that one can um, you know, develop use lava to develop um, neural network architectures and structures without hardware um, and then we have uh, performance and energy um, energy modeling and profiling so modeling is important so that even if you don't run your workload on hardware you can estimate how much gain will i get if i run it on hardware and can already decide you know, whether it's the optimal structure that you have developed um, and profiling will allow you to do it in the pretty fine-grained manner to find the bottlenecks. Um, in the beginning, we'll, we'll have a couple modules there. So I, I'm very proud to that the dynamic neural field library will be part of this network um, and Slayer and some uh, tools to, to build uh, deep uh, learned networks will, will be part of that. And we very much hope that others will join the effort to, to build this whole framework into something bigger so that we can bring the neuromorphic commuting computing community um, forward. There will be some academic funding available soon. It's all coming coming very soon. Um, stay tuned. Um, to, to sneak a little bit on what the key component of LAVA is. Um, so we have um, one part of it, LAVA core. This is the kind of the central element of this. And this will be the Intel's new SDK, Software Development cool Toolkit. And the key idea of this uh, toolkit is that everything is a process. So your architecture will uh, be created from processes. Um, every neuron is a process and the synapse is a process and you create a dynamic neural field population that will be a process that will allow you to you know, encapsulate computational graph and to build modular hierarchical feed forward whichever structures you, you need for to solve your task. Um, this computational graph consists of a state. So, you know, as um, every neuron in our neural network, um, every process should have a state, some behavior. So how this state is supposed to evolve over time. 
um, what kind of computation shall it do you know, at input or just with the passage of time and, and input and output of course to connect um, different states to each other. Um, they can have custom API so the users can define what will be sent around and then of course if you if your process is a leaky integrated pioneer and then probably what you send around are spikes but if your process is something else maybe it could send around some other information to other processes um, and they're composable so you can build these hierarchical structures. We hope that um, by, by doing that, we will create unified structure for processes that run on neuronal cores or also on other cores, so on CPUs or in GPUs. Um, so we want to be hardware agnostic because um, you might have some process required for your robotic task, for instance, that is not well suited for, for, for neuromorphic hardware. You know, robots are not quite, uh, quite like animals, so there might be processes like that for sure. Um, and, and our goal is to create an easy way to create building blocks for neuromorphic applications. Um, like, like the ones that I have shown, that, that were built now with a lot of sweat and work, so we just hope that it will be much easier very soon. All right, so to conclude, um, the future of neuromorphic computing technology. So we believe that some complexity and programmability of individual elements in the spike neural network, neurons, connections between them, and learning rules are required to implement brain-like computing. Because brains are not just homogeneous you know, bags of neurons. They have very intricate structure. The individual neurons are complex and diverse. And, and the structures, the circuits that they build are also sometimes complex and diverse. Um, and, and just homogeneous with forward networks of leaf neurons, they, they are not sufficient to really implement uh, sophisticated tasks. Um, Gradient-based learning, like backpropagation, is great for learning when you have a clear input-output relation and or mapping. If you have the data that describes this mapping very well, but they are an incomplete tool for programming more general behaviors. So if you want to achieve some rich, explainable behavior, like on that robot, so that I know that it's looking for something now, now it's learning, now it's um, asking something or, or gra grasping for something, it requires ex explicit system-level design of that neural network. Um, and we need you know, abstractions, we need some automation and libraries for to, to facilitate the system level design, to, to build reusable building blocks um, that will allow us to easily create um, the software for neuromorphic hardware, software systems for neuromorphic hardware. Um, and, and these building blocks, they may be inspired by neuroscience. I think there's a lot that we could learn from, from modern neuroscience when people discover more and more interesting circuits and interesting structures in brains of different animals, from insects all the way up to humans. Um, and there's a lot we could learn there. We just need some tools in order to capture that knowledge in such a way that we can use uh, this, this knowledge to structure our neuromorphic systems. And also derived from first principles. Um, so from our knowledge of how to solve different tasks, for instance, in robotics, there's a lot of knowledge in control, um, uh, like an optimal control, how to solve different tasks. And, and there might be possibility in some cases to translate algorithms into a neuromorphic domain and, and in some cases they will run even more efficiently than on conventional hardware. Um, so this slide I also um, always very very happy to, to show so everyone who is interested to to join our uh, neuromorphic research community that is driven by Intel it's um, the first step is very easy you just write a one line email to INRC interest at Intel.com and then we'll tell you the rest of the story how to join the community we are really proud that today INRC it's Intel neuromorphic research community with over 120 groups in academia government and, and companies um, who are quite actively working you know, all, all these aspects that are required to move the field forward, right? We need to understand the theory behind neuromorphic computing. We need to uh, come up with new algorithms to solve different tasks. We need to build architectures and systems um, and software and proof of concept um, you know, examples that, that show the world the, the promise and potential of this hardware. Um, and we are you know, very proud of this very um, dynamic and active community. You're very welcome to join. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe I was quite um, efficient and fast and we also started 10 minutes earlier. So we have plenty of time for questions, I believe. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was excellent. Yes, so we are open for questions now. Um, please feel free to raise your hand or um, put questions in the chat. Um, I can go ahead and get us started. Um, so it's very exciting to see uh, some of the early um, 
early description of lava um, and, and what that's going to be doing. And, and certainly the definition of programming abstractions for neuromorphic is a, is a key, um, I think it's a key challenge, one of the biggest challenges in the field um, for right now. So I, you mentioned uh, looking at sort of the automation of, of identifying some of these abstractions. Is there any ongoing research in that area? Um, do y'all have any thoughts about, about what you're gonna do in that space? Um, so I don't know much about automation of finding those uh, levels of abstraction beyond the usual, um, you know, training methods. If you take something like sparse coding, right, or any uh, gradient descent-based learning method um, that allows you to, you know, train some some modules that could uh, bring some level of abstraction. Now, in my thinking um, so far, that was more kind of design thinking. So by either learning from neuroscience or from breakdown of the problem based on you know, just the behavior or conventional understanding of the solution. So which steps are required to solve it? Um, just making breakdown on that level. Um, otherwise, so one level of abstraction where I just, you know, come, come from that field is dynamic neural fields attractor networks. So there's um, the whole community that thinks um, those attractor dynamics are very important. They're important to bridge the time scales um, of individual neurons and behavior. Um, they also signatures of these networks all over the brain and all over behavior. So in behavioral studies, you can see this um, kind of attractor networks. So I believe that these population level attractor dynamics uh, is maybe an important building block to, to build um, you know, more, more abstract description of networks. But there might be other, there are other approaches, right? This vector symbolic architecture approach, right? That, that translates like all the sim symbols that you need for your computation into high dimensional vector spaces. And then they have some nice properties that allow you to do um, some quite powerful computation with symbols. That would be another example. Of approaches. There's no one single approach, and I think it's it's good that way. I think we need uh, diversity at this point of approaches. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. If, yeah. So we have several questions in the chat. Um. So from Alex Jones, uh, thank you for the talk. How does Lava differ from one API? Will Lava make one API or parts of one API obsolete? Mm -hmm. Let me first explain for those who don't know one API. So one API is an effort of Intel um, to to have some software layer. Um, uh, that is unified for different uh, backends, different hardware backends, CPU, GPU, or FPGA, so that you can um, write your code in a, in a similar similar manner. Um, I'm not familiar with it uh, very much in a hands-on manner myself. Uh, in my vision, it would be super interesting to add Lava to one API at some point, because then we join this large scale Intel's effort to ease life of programmers. At the moment, it's still very different because um, neuromorphic hardware is so much different from uh, all of CPU, GPU, or FPGA. So how we think about algorithms, um, how we think about you know, network design and, and what is you know, what is the variable, um, what is an operation, just these notions are so different in, in this view. It's asynchronous, we have this different type of sampling of signals. I think it's very fundamentally uh, different from conventional compute. That's why today LAVA is, is really for neuromorphic systems. It might be not even uh, for Intel's neuromorphic system, more, but also for more general neuromorphic systems. But so far it's not part of one API. And we'll see how it develops, whether it's possible to bring it under. We want to develop it first you know, in itself and see what is it, uh, how will it end up, and then we will see if it fits into this uh, more general purpose framework. So sort of, I think, a follow on from, for your answer to that was uh, from Sunny Baines, would you be able to use Lava as a benchmarking tool for the various hardware types? Hopefully, yes. Yeah. So that's why we so we built all these profiling tools, of course, for our hardware, because we know all the intricate details. We can do that. Um, if um, other people join and find Lava useful for, for building architectures, then we hope that we will also build such profiling tools for their hardware um, and, and also their compilers for other types of hardware. And then we could um, hopefully use it yeah, for, for benchmarking in comparison. We, of course, will do as much as possible ourselves. So currently, Lava has as a backend no, our chips. Um, and just TensorFlow. So we can compare uh, workloads with this TensorFlow backend running on a CPU or a GPU and, and um, we'll issue today. Yeah. Um, from Farhana Afrin, uh, can you tell more about how to join the research team? 
Okay, so the first step is just to write email on this INRC underscore interest until column. Um, then you'll get back the, the next steps. Uh, it's mainly two steps. So we want teams to write up uh, a research proposal uh, that describes what do you want to do on the issue so that we know you know, it makes sense, it will fit the chip, we can help, we can support that. Um, if you don't apply for funding with us, there's no competition there. There's only a sanity check. Um, and then there's an INRC agreement. So there's a legal agreement involved, which your institution needs to needs to sign. And there we just agree on the terms of you know, IP, uh, no licensing. Um, we, we want people to share whatever they learn from you know, exploring Loihi because we want the community to grow. Um, so if you plan to you know, sell some device with Loihi integrated in it, then we'll probably have a problem. If you, you know, just want to write a couple of papers, there's no problem at all. If you're somewhere in between, then, then there are terms in this agreement that can be negotiated. And that's it. And, and we will have a call for uh, projects with funding uh, very soon, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, that will be competitive. And we just need to write a good proposal. <laughs> I think this is a little bit of a, a joke of a question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because the volcano theme makes me laugh as well. Um, will you use magma <laughs> Python based HDL description in Lava? Python based description in Lava. Hmm, I don't know. I will answer very, <laughs> very honestly. We'll see. <laughs> so uh, the next question oh, from. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, the next question uh, from Gina Adam. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Have you noticed any limitations in the applications your team or the INRC can tackle due to the scale of the low EHE chip? Any plans to scale up? Definitely, definitely. When, when we <laughs> try to put the transformer network on it or a larger YOLO network, we face the limitation very, very directly. Um, so we have, of course, limitation in number of neurons, like only our large system uh, has um, 100 million neurons, but it's a large system, right? And um, like many, many chips involved. And then we have some limitation in the fan out, right? So per core, you can have 100 million synapses, um, might be a limiting factor. Um, we, of course, like as technology develops, uh, we will squeeze more neurons in the chip. So I think th this limitation will be uh, released in, in future generations of the chip, for sure. Um, another approach would be to try to not develop such big networks, maybe, because these very large networks, especially if they are very, very deep, you have to train them with really, really lots of data. And for many tasks, you won't have so much data. And after you have trained them with so much data, they will become very rigid. If something in your data changes, or you, know, you forgot one image that was you know, important for you, um, then you have to retrain again. So this whole paradigm of getting bigger and bigger and brute force, uh, maybe not, not the only way to go. Maybe one could think a little bit how can, one can make the networks more compact and then feed them in more compact form factor. I think these constraints can actually be inspiring and can force the creativity in developing neural network structures. So I'll, I'll sort of follow up on, on that. Uh, yeah, Gina agrees. I also agree. Um, so the, uh, I, I really enjoy the, the focus on this control oriented and robotics oriented applications um, that you're working on. So for things like the high speed drone applications, are there any limitations with Loihi right now in terms of sort of latency, the response times? <laughs> So I think we we uh, came very far with that little example. So remember, we are using this prototype chip. We use the Capojo Bay device. This is our two chip um, device with the USB two connector. Um, so although the camera uh, input could go directly into the chip with AER interface, but still it needed to go over a little tiny Lakeman processor on chip. Um, and then the motor commands, they would go over USB to an upboard and then from there to flight controller and ESC controller. And we could achieve the latency of below two milliseconds, which was enough for, for this application. Um, and, and the control rate of 20 kilohertz, which is more than anything else um, like for in this setup so far. Um, so that was enough for this drone. This, for this drone, you don't even need it faster. Um, and I think, uh, in the, again, future systems, right? They can have better, better IO. Uh, better interfaces. And then we could also read out the output, the spikes more directly and direct them to, let's say, electronic speed controllers. Um, so I think we are you know, quite quite in a good state there. Of course, I always very often the bottleneck. Yeah. If you want to feed in high definition videos into the chip, uh, you might need to wait for our next system. Next gen system. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Maybe I can ask one question, Katie. Yeah. Hi, Melika. 
Hi, Julia. It's good to see you. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I just wanted to maybe <laughs> ask a, a controversial question a little bit. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm on your side in you know trying to be brain inspired and and kind of go beyond beyond backprop and and so on. But I just have one question, and is that uh, you know you're talking about scaling up and and um, scaling up seems to be important also for you. And when we're talking about scaling up, you know, these kind of bottom up approaches of using, you know, this neuronal um, computational primitives, like winner take all or, um, or net, basically computational primitives like that, it is really unclear how these kind of networks can can really scale up, right? Because it's, it's really a bottom up inspiration from what we see in the brain without any objective function that is really being optimized right so i'm just i'm just wondering how do you think these kind of networks can can scale up or what is your intuition about it generally so i think there are different different facets to to answer these questions the first this inspiration from the brain can be on different scales on different levels, right? We we definitely do a lot of bottom up uh, inspiration in neuromorphic computing, and that starts with neuronal model, maybe some some micro, micro, microscopical circuits, but there are also some higher level models from the brain, like for instance that SLAM architecture that goes quite largely you know, across the brain. You have a hippocampal network, you have a terrinal cortex, you have maybe some prefrontal cortex that orchestrates the whole thing. So this is um, an inspiration on the um, Kind of neuronal architecture level, right? So that's already large scale um, structures that we can 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 borrow from biology in order to structure the the network. Um, similarly, uh, for some tasks where we have this you no know, first principles, where we have a solution, we have an algorithm that solves the task, and we know the, the algorithm is maybe optimal, right? You know, it has been found by and verified in many many platforms, um, but we know that it can run faster and more efficiently in neuromorphic hardware. Then we can also just take this algorithm, translate it into the architecture. Um, now, uh, learning and optimizing some object objective function, I think that has a very important role when we learn some task specific behavior. So, in, in the robotic example, you know, I have my, my robot, it needs to be ready to learn a couple particular objects that I wanted to learn. And there, there will be a clear objective function that needs to be able to distinguish these 10 objects and localize them in the environment. So this is more task specific. It will need some architecture to be in place in order to do that. Um, and I don't think that we can learn this architecture with the gradient descent. Uh, we might be able to find it with some evolutionary research because this is how biology found those architectures. So our brain when we are born is extremely structured thing. Um, and that structure was found over a million, million years of, uh, of evolution. So maybe we can simulate that evolutionary processes. Um, I think gradient um, descent can only bring us to some good solution in some um, you know, well-defined um, space where our cost of objective function is nice, convex, uh, not too multimodal thing. Um, otherwise, we need some, some more random search-like methods um, of structural search for architectures. And there are people who work on that, right? They work on evolutionary uh, approaches to finding structure in some other you know, search methods in, in graph structures um, with a more, more kind of systematic approach of looking for architectures. I am not an expert in those. So for me, it's more satisfying to learn something from biology, you know, build that circuit, maybe by doing that also better understand what happens in biology, because of course our understanding is always limited if you look in, in detail. And there, you know, at INI in Zurich, we were very lucky that we had those neuroscience people next door. And you can really learn to appreciate how much is still unclear and not really known. And there, this idea that we will try to build something similar is really helpful because it helps you to close some gaps. So for me personally, that way it's just more and more inspiring and more interesting to explore. But there are people working on more systematic ways to find structures. Thanks a lot, Julia. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll advocate for evolutionary approaches to discovering architectures since that's what my research area is. I think Tom, Tom has a question. <laughs> Hey, uh, hi, Julia. Uh, that was a really good talk. Thank you very much. Um, does Intel have plans to uh, to make uh, Luigi, um, you know, publicly available? And uh, and do you have do you have plans for future future development? You know, sort of version two, version three. Um, so future development, yes, for sure. That's my plan is filled. 
for years to come, no worries. <laughs> Um, it is kind of half publicly available. You just need to sign that RNFC agreement and it promise us that you won't run off and, and uh, start building product with it because it's not a product, it's a research chip, right? So we want to explore the space of algorithms. It's a general purpose uh, chip. We envision that maybe we will find some really, really good application for it. And then we will specialize the hardware for that application. So at the end, it won't be, you know, Kapoho basic, that's also the application, but something that you can embed in your, in your system. And that thing probably will be become part of a product or maybe a product itself. Um, so there is no currently plan to make Loihi a product, um, but anyone is welcome to join our INRC community and get access to the chip either over cloud or even we can even send the hardware uh, you know, into your lab if you need the physical device device there. Yeah, it just requires some, some legal framework for us to do it safely because we don't want people to rely on our technology to build their products. So we need for them to realize it's a research ship no, no product so far. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and, and any plan for future future chips, future releases? Just, just hold on. Just wait for the vacation period to end, and and then. <laughs> I, I got it. I, I know that's a loaded question, but I, I <laughs> then appreciate the next step will be. So But yeah, we, we constantly work on improving the chip. So the main goal of the you know, this research community is to learn what is missing, what could be improved, what could be done better, and we work on the next generation. And um, there are a couple of next generations are in 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 plan and production now. Yeah. Wonderful. So Thank you very much. And I think we'll we'll end on a couple of I'm going to combine a couple of questions from the chat into one. Um, since uh, Loihi is a pure digital processor, will CMOS alone be what the future of AI chips are? Is there plans to incorporate other emerging technologies like memorative based systems into uh, into neural market hardware that Intel is developing? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of diversity and I think we need and we will need different types of technology it depends on the application depends on the constraints that you have if you have some application with very very strict power constraints then digital CMOS has its limitations so we will never go into microwatt uh, you know power budget uh, and for these applications new technology might be needed might be useful all those memories spintronic where you have really tiny devices that implement your your synapses um, when and if Intel will subscribe to this type of technology, I cannot tell you. So, you know, Intel has this whole, you know, tool chain and everything for digital technology. This we can do very well. We know very well what we are doing. Um, so I don't think that Intel will jump into you know, building those new research technology very soon. Uh, but who knows? You know, we, we also have, we are Intel Lab. So we're a research organization. We are part of emerging technologies lab. Um, so, you know, it might be that there will be some someone who says, hey, I want to do memory research, and then they will explore it. Is everyone else expose it in the research. Uh, but for the future of AI, if we want to have those smart sensors, smart everything all around us, I think we will need to bring the power budget even further down, much, much further down. So I think the all the new technologies that have been developed, they will find their place in the landscape. <laughs>